topic for tonight is what language did the Buddha speak? In the suttas, the, monk, the Buddha encouraged monks to share the Dhamma in the local vernacular to make it easily understood by the people. We know that the Buddha did not speak Sanskrit, which was already a liturgical language that the Brahmins used to chant the Vedas. We don't know when the Tripikata was written down. The first records of this being done was in Sri Lanka about 300 years after the Buddha, but it may have been written in India before that. As the Buddha was born in North Central India, he would have spoken one of the Prakits, the languages current in that region. To throw some light on this subject, we have our speaker this evening who has written a book, Footprints in the Dust, the Life of the Buddha from the Most Ancient Sources. Our speaker this evening is Venerable Shravasti Damika, who was born in Australia and ordained as a Buddhist monk in India. He later lived in Sri Lanka, where he became well known for his efforts to promote Buddhism. For some years, he lived in Singapore as the spiritual advisor of the Buddha Mandala Society and several other Buddhist groups. He now lives in Queensland, Australia. Venerable Damika has written many books on Buddhism and related topics. His most popular book, Good Questions, Good Answers, has been reprinted many times and translated into 36 languages. Let us now put our hands together and welcome Venerable Damika for his sharing. Over to you, Bhante. Right. Okay, here, there, here I am. Right. Uh, th thank you for that, uh, Bobby. And uh, also, I'd like to uh, express my appreciation to the uh, Buddhist Gem Fellowship for inviting me to give this talk uh, tonight. Uh, the subject is uh, what the Buddha taught. Uh, what what language th did the Buddha speak? And um, whenever we're speaking about languages and dialects and what have you, and particularly if we have to go back into ancient history, it's going to be somewhat uh, technical. Um, so I'm going to try to uh, simplify the issues as, uh, as much as I can. One reason why this uh, subject is important is because uh, as Buddhists, we, it's important to know as much as we can about the person who uh, has taught us what we um, uh, use as the guideposts in our life. And of course, uh, knowing the Buddha's teachings, his philosophy, his ethics is far more important than knowing about him personally. Nonetheless, knowing something about him as a, as a man and, for example, what he spoke, th this is uh, um, an, a subject that should be of some interest to Buddhists anyway. Um, the problem is, is that uh, the Buddha lived in a world where writing had not come into widespread use yet. We don't know when uh, writing did um, start uh, becoming uh, used in India, but the first uh, written records that we have from northern India are the edicts of King Asoka. And um, from this, we can tell that um, Pali, which is the language that the Buddhist scriptures are written in, is somewhat different from King, the language that King Asoka used. And so it seems very unlikely that the Buddha spoke what is now called Pali. Um, um, the general consensus among scholars is that Pali is um, either a language from Western um, uh, India or probably more likely that it was a, um, um, a, a literary language. I'll explain it like this. Even in northern India today, there are many languages and dialects. Uh, people think that everybody speaks uh, Hindi, but this is not so at all. Uh, there's a wide variety of, of dialects. Most people can communicate with each other, but they also uh, uh, notice that the person who lives 200 or 300 kilometers away may have a different accent, may use slightly different words and so on. And it was probably the same uh, in, in, in um, ancient India. So probably at some point, um, uh, a literary language was created so that 
people in through a wide uh, area of northern India could understand what was being said. And so Pali was probably a literary language or maybe a Creole or um, a slightly artificial language. That is the general consensus amongst scholars and has been for quite some time. However, I'd like to point out that not everybody uh, agrees with this uh, understanding. And in fact, just recently, Professor Richard Gombridge, from, um, uh, who was uh, teaching Sanskrit and Buddhism at uh, Oxford University, has just written this book um, in which he um, argues very strongly that in fact the Buddha did speak Pali. However, whatever the situation is, whatever language the Buddha did speak, he spoke a language similar to Pali. If the Buddha were alive today and we uh, quoted some verses from the Tripitaka and that, he could probably understand uh, and understand most of it. Um, uh, so if the Buddha didn't speak Pali, what did he speak? Well, as I said, because we have no written records from that time, we, see, we simply don't know. But um, once again, the general consensus is that he probably spoke several languages or dialects. Like I said, all related, closely related to each other. Um, so uh, it's very likely that merchants or uh, ambassadors or people like that, people who traveled widely, um, probably were familiar with a wide variety of languages. And because we know that the Buddha wandered very widely through, through northern India, it is very likely that he spoke uh, or was familiar with several languages. And in fact, in the Tipitaka, there is um, evidence for this. In the uh, Majjhima Nikaya, in the um, Aranna Vibhanga Sutta, um, uh, the Buddha actually points out that there are different words for a bowl in different regions in North India. And he actually then uh, gives eight different words for a bowl. So this would suggest that he knew perhaps something of at least eight different languages. Um, so uh, this is what we could this is uh, what we could say on that subject. Um, he also uh, it's also important to um, make it clear that the Buddha certainly did not speak Sanskrit. Sanskrit is a very ancient language. It was spoken. It was a, a, a vernacular spoken about a thousand years before the Buddha, um, and the the most ancient Brahminical scriptures, the Vedas, were recorded in uh, in Sanskrit. Um, but over time, as language changed, the language in the Vedas did not change, and yet it was still chanted in that ancient language. So that by the, uh, the time of the Buddha, probably most people did not speak language. It was the ancient uh, Vedic hymns were chanted in that language. However, um, we do know about maybe 100, perhaps 150 years after the Buddha, a, probably one of the greatest grammarians of all time, Panini, laid down rules for uh, 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 speaking and pronouncing uh, uh, Sanskrit and gradually over the next four or five hundred years um, Sanskrit became a spoken language again um, but it was not widely spoken it was used the way Latin was in Europe in the Middle Ages if you were a very well educated person if you were a theologian or a professor or perhaps if you were in the royal court you spoke Latin likewise in in ancient India some four five six hundred years after the Buddha the same thing happened in India if you were a, a Brahmin priest if you were a prince if you were a uh, an Ayurvedic physician or something like that, you probably spoke uh, Sanskrit. You may have also spoken other languages, but 
gradually Sanskrit became the, um, the language of the upper class and it became the language of culture. So uh, what happened was gradually languages like Pali and what have you tended to be neglected and any, any texts of any importance, law books, uh, books on um, philosophy or history or medicine, inevitably they were written in Sanskrit. And to be a learned person, you had to know Sanskrit to be able to learn those things. So the situation was very similar to the role of uh, Latin in European culture. Um, and this explains why Mahayana sutras and later um, uh, Savaka uh, uh, sutras, that is not Mahayana and not Theravada, but sort of transitional forms of Buddhism used Sanskrit because that was the language that educated people spoke. That was the language that uh, reached out to or became familiar with anybody who had a, um, an education. But that was not the case in the 5th century BC. The Buddha may very well have known a few Sanskrit words. He must have heard the Vedas being chanted, but he certainly didn't uh, speak um, Sanskrit. And in fact, in the, in the Vinaya, we have a very interesting um, uh, event where two uh, monks who, were from the Bra who had been from the Brahmin caste asked the Buddha or they suggested to the Buddha that all of his sermons be rendered into Sanskrit um, so that uh, uh, they would never change because Sanskrit was, as I said, already a liturgical language, a, if you like, a dead language. The belief was that it simply wouldn't evolve, it wouldn't change. And therefore, if the Buddhist sermons were put into Sanskrit, they would never change. They could be preserved forever. Um, and it's very interesting what the Buddha had to say about this. He very strongly criticized these monks for making this suggestion. And he said that um, this idea would be of not of benefit to people who had uh, an interest in the Dhamma. And he summed up by saying, I want you to learn the Dhamma each in your own language. And the actual words he used was Sakaya uh, Nirudya, which simply means your own language or your own dialect. And this is very significant too, because this is undoubtedly the reason why Buddhism spread widely, firstly in India and then in other places in Asia, because monks um, did not use probably Pali and they probably did, and they certainly did not use Sanskrit. They preached the Dhamma in the language of the area they were in. And in that same sutta, the Aranya Vibhanga Sutta, the Buddha says that if you insist on using your language or your terminology in a region where uh, people are not familiar with it, all you do is cause, <laughs> cause confusion. So uh, the Buddha had a very uh, sensible, a very practical, a very intelligent approach to language. Now, of course, things did change and people did not always take the uh, Buddhist teachings seriously. So when uh, Buddhism eventually spread to Sri Lanka, it was taken to Sri Lanka. By that time, it was in Pali. And in actual fact, the ancient Sinhalese um, came to believe that the Buddha spoke Pali and that to understand the Dhamma, you had to know Pali. And that is a quite a different position from the Buddha's position. To know the Bible, you do not have to learn ancient Greek or Aramaic. And to know the Dhamma well, you do not need to know Pali. However, it can be useful to have some knowledge of Pali. Pali is a, it has its own grace and beauty as a language. Um, there are many important technical terms in the Dhamma that are in Pali, and so sometimes it is useful to know particular words. And um, uh, somebody who uh, is taking Pali seriously, or the person, the type of person who should take Pali seriously and learn it well, should be somebody who intends to go very deeply into Dhamma, or perhaps to become a 
um, a professional teacher of Dhamma or a university professor or something like that, so that they have direct um, access to the, 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 the Buddhist teachings. But for the ordinary person, knowing words like metta or karuna or, or whatever, this is, uh, this is very useful. Um, and uh, um, uh, for myself, hearing um, some of the Buddha's discourses like the Mangala Sutta or the Metta Sutta being uh, chanted in Pali, it, it, um, I, I find it quite uplifting because although I don't think the Buddha spoke Pali, uh, I know that he spoke something or uh, something similar to that. And to hear that sound in some sense in my imagination carries me back to the time of the Buddha and I almost get the feeling that I'm listening to him, to him speaking. Um, and certainly learning some discourses in, in Pali, particularly things like the Mangala Sutta and the Metta Sutta, can be uh, used um, uh, as a prelude to meditation to calm your mind. But if you're going to do that, then it's um, important to pronounce the Pali uh, properly. And this does not always happen. So I'd like to just uh, sort of briefly uh, talk about uh, how to pronounce Pali properly because it's not too difficult when you know how to do it. So um, first of all there are eight vowels in uh, Pali. Um, uh, there they are there. So there are what's called rasa and diga. So rasa means short vowel and diga means long vowel. So the vowels, the Pali vowels are these a, a, i, i, u, u, e, o. It's as simple as that. So the, the long vowels, the uh, diga vowels, you'll notice they have a diacritical mark above them. So I just want to look at a few um, Pali words that I often hear being uh, mispronounced. So uh, the first one we'll look at is. Um, the uh, the one of the books in the Pali Tipitaka which preserves the um, rules and regulations for Buddhist monks and nuns, and I've often seen it pronounced like this: Vinaya with a long a. Okay, so the Buddha's uh, rules are preserved in the Vinaya, but if you look at the second word there, it is not a long vowel. So it is not vinaya, but rather vinya. And how you can tell very easily is you just break it up. Vi, na, ya, vinaya. As simple as that. Not vinaya, but vinaya. So that's, uh, that's one. Another one that I often hear mispronounced is um, the word for the uh, for the Buddhist scriptures, um, the Buddhist sacred scriptures, which is um, uh, here we have it here. So I often hear it being pronounced as pit, uh, tipitaka, <laughs> which sounds rather funny to me. So using a long vowel, in actual fact, it's tipitika, or in Sanskrit, it would be tripitika with an R. But either way, whether in Sanskrit or Pali, it does not have a long vowel. And once again, if you look at the second uh, word there, you just break it up. Tipitaka, tipitika, not tipitaka. Tipitaka, tipitika, as simple as that. Um, another word that, once again, I hear sometimes mis mispronounced is uh, the word for the wandering ascetics of the time. Um, so uh, uh, the word here is samana, or sometimes I hear it used as Sanskrit, which is shramana. And once again, if you look at the second word there, that's the correct spelling. Samana, samana, not shramana. So it's neither samana or shramana, but samana or in Sanskrit, shramana. Okay. And the one that I, I think that um, 
really uh, grates with me is this one. <laughs> Westerners tend to do this quite a lot, particularly Americans. I hear Americans refer to Buddhism or the Buddha using a long U. But if you look at the bottom line there, that's the correct spelling. It's not Buddha and it's not Buddhism. It's Buddha or Buddhism, a short um, U. Okay. So if you just remember the, uh, and you recognize the vowels, if you could put them back up again, um, all you have to do is keep in mind that when you see a letter, an A, I, or U, with a stroke above it, it is pronounced uh, in a long fashion. A, E, U. A, A, E, E, U, U, E, O. Okay. Um, I think that's uh, the main things that I can, I can think of. Um, Perhaps we can talk very briefly about um, the structure of the Pali Tipitaka. So in ancient times, there were actually several Tipitakas. Each of the early schools of Buddhism had their own Tipitaka. But the Tipitaka in Pali, which is used in the Theravada tradition, is without any doubt the, the oldest of these Tipitakas. And it is the only one that is, uh, has been preserved completely. So the other Tipitakas were uh, uh, written in Sanskrit. They were written, they weren't, um, they weren't uh, recited. Um, and eventually they were taken by Buddhist monks or sometimes by Chinese monks coming to India, to China, where they were translated into, uh, into Chinese. Unfortunately, even the, some of the Mahayana uh, Tipitakas were not completely translated into Chinese. Um, only the uh, Tipitaka of the Theravada tradition is complete in, in all senses. And um, the reason for this was that at a very early date, tradition says during the time of King Asoka, which was about 200 years after the Buddha, uh, the um, uh, my battery is getting low. You'll have to excuse me for a minute while I turn on my electricity. I apologize for that interruption. So um, it seems that the Tipitaka was already rendered into uh, Pali and uh, it was taken to uh, Sri Lanka and it was preserved with great fidelity there. Uh, and eventually in about 100 BC, it was actually committed to writing. But we are very certain that even after the Tipitaka was committed to writing in Sri Lanka, it may have been committed to writing earlier in India. But the earliest record we have of it being written down comes from Sri Lanka. We are very certain that even when it was written down, for the most part, the Sangha still maintained the oral tradition. They were suspicious of writing. And for us, in a world where writing is universal, and in the West and in many other countries, uh, literacy is widespread, we tend to think that writing something down would preserve it much better than memory. But this is certainly not the case. First of all, we simply don't have such great memories because we don't need them. We have everything written down. We know from studies that because young people nowadays have calculators and what have you, their ability to do mathematics has declined very badly. Likewise, writing or spelling has declined very badly because we all have spell checks. But in a world in the 5th century BC when there was no writing, people's memories were considerably more developed than they are now. 
And another reason why they had such good, good memories is, well, they didn't have cell phones and telephones and televisions and newspapers and what have you. They were living in a fairly quiet world. So if you were a monk or a nun living in a monastery or a nunnery and that, you had very few distractions. And we know that at least a thousand years before the Buddha, the Brahmins, the priest of the Brahminical religion, had um, committed the Vedic hymns to memory and had developed technologies of uh, enormous uh, complexity and sophistication whereby they were able to remember the, um, the Vedic hymns with great accuracy. And uh, first of all, they just simply started learning them when they were a child. When a, a Brahmin boy was about eight, he started learning these things by heart. So by the time he was 30 or 40, he, he knew vast amounts of literature by heart. And um, the, these Vedic hymns were not chanted by an individual. They were chanted in by groups of Brahmins. And so it was virtually impossible either to, uh, to make a change to the, uh, the Vedas or to mispronounce them because the majority always knew them. And so if you forgot a part or you mispronounced it, you were automatically corrected by all those around you who were chanting it properly and chanting it completely. Okay. Now, if we look at the, um, the makeup of the Buddha's Sangha, his monks and nuns, but in particular his monks, we find that roughly about 30% from what we can tell were from the Brahmin caste. Um, or from the Brahmin uh, class. Now, certainly not all Brahmins spent their whole lives learning the Vedas by heart, but many did. And probably the religious ones who tended to be the ones who converted to Buddhism probably were already very well schooled in these memoric devices, which helped them to preserve the uh, the Vedas, and they simply bought the skills that they had used to remember the Vedas to remembering the Buddha's sermons. Um, there seems little doubt that some parts of the Tipitaka have been added to, and there seems little doubt that some parts of the Tipitaka may have been lost, small sections have been lost, but what we have today reflects probably very closely what the Buddha said in terms of meaning. And because it's all composed in Pali, it's very likely that uh, not just the meaning, but the, the grammar, the structure, etc., is similar to what the Buddha spoke. And that is good enough. Um, the important thing is the meaning, not the sound. Uh, when we want to know the Buddha's Dhamma, any language will do. Uh, any language is uh, capable of transmitting the ideas that the Buddha wanted transmitted. And so, as I said previously, learning, the, uh, learning Pali can be very useful if you intend to go into Buddhism very, very deeply. And knowing some Pali words, individual Pali words can be helpful. Also, it may impress your friends, <laughs> but it is simply not necessary. And uh, over the last, well, over the last hundred years, the Tipitaka has gradually been translated into, um, into English and other languages also, but let's talk about English. Um, and especially in the last 25 or 30 years, new translations have come out by Western Buddhist monks and some Asian Buddhist monks, which are of the highest um, uh, accuracy. So if you look today, um, the uh, translations of the American monk uh, Bhikkhu Bodhi, he has translated the uh, Majjhima Nikaya, the middle length sayings. He's translated the Angutra Nikaya, the, the numbered sayings or the numerical sayings. Uh, he's translated the um, uh, Samyutta Nikaya, the uh, uh, related sayings. 
And just recently, uh, he has translated, done a wonderful translation of the Sutta Nipata, which is an extremely interesting book in the Pali Tipitaka. And um, where there are complex terms in Pali, which uh, need explaining, he has given very uh, lucid, detailed and accurate notes so that anybody who wants to know exactly what the Buddha meant or what the the suttas means can get them. And so we're a very, very fortunate position to nowadays to have direct access to um, the words of the Buddha as they were preserved in Pali at a very early stage in, uh, in uh, the, the story of Buddhism. Um, I think that's about the main things that I, I have to say. So um, I would be very uh, happy to uh, answer any questions anybody has on the subject.